Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Rigor Mortis Podcast. My name is Adam, and again with me this week, my partner in true crime, we got Jason. How are you today, Adam? I'm doing pretty good, buddy. Doing pretty good. Holidays are coming. Holidays are coming. It's getting colder, and I think next week we're moving this inside to my, I think parents, so too. my I, parents' basement. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree, and uh, hopefully that'll help us with uh, comfort level, but... Um, uh, Holidays coming up. What do you think? Maybe release a second episode for our uh, listeners one of these weeks coming up? I'd love to because, you know, I'll tell you what, on Instagram and on Twitter, people are like, what would it take to get a second episode? Yeah. It's hard. You know, you work nights. I work days. Um, so to consistently do that might be challenging at this point. But I think we can stretch it a little bit here, man. Put in some extra hours in the rigor mortis chambers and pump out two in one week. I think we can do it. Yeah, I think so too. And definitely won't be an every week thing, but uh, something we'd like to do every couple months maybe just show our appreciation. Show a little love to the rigor mortis nation. Oh, you know, we need to because they've shown us a lot of love. They've been yeah. very supportive and we definitely appreciate that. I think we can swing it. Absolutely. Let's, let's get cracking on that. So, Speaking of getting cracking, homeboy, what do we got going on today? Today we got the story of the uh, Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. Yeah, this is one I had never heard of before. I feel like I say that a lot. Like, you come up with something, and I'm like, what the hell is this? And then I look into it, and I'm like, Jason picks another good one. <laughs> yeah, you type into that old Google machine, and you'd be surprised what you'll find for, for stories that we can do. Yeah, this is, a, this is a crazy one, because it starts off like a paradise it's so fun innocent. kind of thing for children, you know, just yeah. to go run off and create some dreams and memories, rather, and... Then it goes wrong. It does. So. It goes wrong very fast. So um, basically what where this takes place is in uh, Locust Grove, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. uh, at a place called Camp Scott. Yeah, now this is a uh, heavily forested type of area. It's about 400 acres into the wilderness. Um, and it's used by not just Girl Scouts, and it, but Boy Scouts as well. Yeah, I think that uh, the camp had opened in 1920, and I think it was open for about seven years between before the Girl Scouts kind of took over ownership and uh, and management of the uh, of the properties. So, um, you know, and so they had possessed it at this point for 50 years. 50 years. And yeah. This will take the story almost 50 years forward to 1977. Yeah, and everything has gone you know without a hitch basically, essentially for that 50 years. I mean, of course, normal issues, but. Um, you know, very safe uh, camp that the Girl Scouts are running and it's oh, very wow. popular, very popular amongst families. I mean, um, back in those times, it was very important to have your kids, you know, learn the survival skills and whatnot from uh, from Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. Very important, even living where we live also. You know what I mean? These are these are things that kids learn that last a lifetime. Memories that, that are formed that will last a lifetime. And so for 50 years, you had children enjoying Camp Scott, in Locust Grove, Oklahoma. Yeah, and uh, 1977, it's you know supposed to be the same, same thing they do every year. Basically, you're gonna have this camp and uh, you're gonna have a blast. And they end up uh, arriving to this camp on a Sunday. It was June 12th of 1977, and um, I think it was like 60 or 70 Girl Scouts arrive at this camp. Yeah. Now let's talk about this camp a little bit, right? It's it's eight tents. Now, these are not small tents. These are large tents that are held to enough to accommodate, like you said, 60 children and counselors. Now, they have it set up. There's eight tents set up. Tent number one being the counselor's tent, where they're all going to stay for the night. And then kind of stretched out, I believe, how many yards was it apart? Something I think like it was almost 80 yards. Almost 80 yards tent between. one and tent eight. So You may not even see the other tent. Right, what especially I'm throughout at. the woods. I mean, this is a very wooded area. It's not like a straight a straight sight line. Uh, these are kind of situated in like a, a crescent, semicircle type of uh, type of way. Yeah, for sure. So for it's sure. kind of weird uh, to have the counselors in tent one. Why wouldn't you put them right in the middle? Well, when... When you're not expecting terrible things to happen, and terrible things generally don't happen in this area, especially, you know, at that time. And we had 50 years of campers going on, camping and, and, right. and all these experiences. And up until this point, it hasn't been an issue. So it's just probably something that never crossed anybody's mind. Where it would nowadays, you know, in, right. in uh, 2019, 20, mm -hmm. Now 2020, you'd have counselors between every tent, probably. You'd have a counselor every in every tent yeah. nowadays because of the... Uh, uh, I don't know about that. That's, the, a, that's just got that. slippery slope. Well, no, too, I, I believe this was, a, you know, Girl Scouts and the counselors were all female. Yeah. So yeah. in that kind of case, you probably would. This story really... Uh, really takes place at the very last tent, be tent eight, which is the furthest one away from the counselors, kind of following through that 
that crescent, like you said. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there were three of the, the girls who showed up to camp that day uh, were Lori Farmer, uh, Denise Milner. Now, Lori was eight and Denise was 10. And also uh, Michelle Goose, who uh, was nine years old. So these three girls, and I believe there was another girl as well originally, get assigned to 10-8. So they're going to be the farthest ones from the counselors. Now, did all the um, the campers arrive this day, or were they, they scattered? Like, was this just a few that came and there would be more coming, or were they all there and, you know, tents in, uh, the camp's in full motion? I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that they were all there that day. And it was kind of uh, basically arrival day. Basically, camp starts tomorrow type of deal, I believe. But, you know, these girls are, uh, like I said, 8, 9, and 10, and they're all kind of uh, a little bit... Uh, different from each other, I guess. I mean, Lori is full of adventure, always wanted to be like her, you know, the older girls and things like that, very mature for her age. Um, so she begged her mom to, to be able to go on this Girl Scout trip, and eventually her mom relented, uh, even though she was just eight years old. But she felt, you know, the Girl Scouts are going to run a nice, safe camp, and maybe she'll learn some, some valuable things. No doubt. Uh, Denise Milner, on the other hand, was almost forced by her parents to go. As almost an experience, you know, you know how it is. You have a, you have a kid. It was like a, she was kind of nervous about going, very apprehensive. Definitely one that was described as being adventurous, but did have some reservations about going. Yeah, I think from what I had read that she uh, originally kind of was gung-ho about it. She really wanted to go, but as it got closer, she... Got more and more nervous about it, more nervous about being home, you know, or uh, away from home and her and her parents and things like that. But, you know, I, I had a friend like this growing up. This isn't uncommon to me to yeah. have a, oh, I want to spend the night. Okay, nine ten o'clock at night, they start getting a little, eh, I miss my parents. And, you know, within an hour or so, their parents are there picking them up. Yeah, and I bet you Denise's parents, you know, knowing her as well as they did, were like, she's going to spend that first night. And give us a uh, not a phone call probably. But. Well, they wrote they wrote letters, right. you know. But she, but what I'm thinking is that they were like she's going to spend that first night, and then she's going to have a hell of a time the rest of this trip. Once she gets used to her accommodations, yeah. you know what I mean. So yeah. so she went to camp. You know, they they let her go. Yeah, sent her. Like I had mentioned, they uh, were assigned to ten eight. So. They go into their into the uh, tent and start writing letters home, I believe, because there was a thunderstorm that night. Yeah, had it been raining. Yeah, and thunder uh, or lightning must be real loud in Oklahoma, I'd imagine. I could only imagine. I've seen some of those yeah. southern storms; they're outrageous. But yeah. Um, yeah, they're in there writing the letter, and the counselor comes, and the fourth girl is told that her uh, original tent she was supposed to be in now had space for, so she was able to uh, leave tent eight that night and go. So there was a fourth girl with. Uh, with Denise and Lori and Michelle. Yes. Okay, yes. so she had left. Now, there's, there's only three. Those three are, remain in, in tent eight. Right. Okay. Right. And uh, like I had mentioned, that the, the girls were in their tent because of the thunderstorm, and they were writing notes back home. What did their notes have to say? Well, Denise's note kind of wrote, as we described earlier, as you could imagine from what we described earlier, basically that you know, she's homesick and she's ready to go home and it's raining and it's wet you know, almost like a plea to get picked up. Yeah, and I think that uh, her her mom basically had convinced her when they got there to just stay for a couple nights and, and we'll see how it goes. If you want me to get you, I will. So, of course, she's homesick and she wants to go home, but uh, unfortunately, she's never going to have that chance. And the two other girls are basically writing that they are having a good time. Uh, one of them actually is, you know, reading the note. She's really... They seemed very intelligent. She put dates and times and really explained what was going on. Very organized. Very organized, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, the girls, obviously, when they're done writing notes, it's probably close to bedtime. So, you know, they head in, and the counselors are uh, basically doing their, their sweep to make sure everything is all... All the girls are you know, in bed, and everything is kind of where it's supposed to be for the night. Oh, yeah, checking the tents, last calls, yeah, yeah. all that kind of stuff, yeah. And as they're doing these uh, you know, these checks, they the counselors actually notice that there's a flashlight off in the distance. And, of course, this is weird out in the middle of the woods. Weird but not. I mean, like I said earlier, there's a Boy Scout camp there. I mean, who knows? Could be something to do with them. I, I believe there's another camp also, like a private camp that's not too far away from what I understand. Uh, maybe a few miles away, but nonetheless, that they're in the woods, but there's other people around. So I could see where you'd say, "Oh, there's a flashlight," but maybe it doesn't raise any alarms. Well, to me, it would be weird, but you're you're more woodsy than me, so I would guess that you've probably seen stuff like that. But what is weird is that when the counselors 
flash their flashlights in the direction of where they're seeing this light, the light shuts off. Okay, that's a little weird. Yeah, that's obviously somebody who's like, oh, I've been seeing, like... Yeah, but well, being in similar situations, you know, uh, usually you do something like that, somebody will wave the light, it's like a hello. Right, right. Kind of a thing. Uh, right. To shut the light off and it's pitch black, out, it's kind of... Yeah, and well, I think weird. that the counselors uh, were probably slightly weirded out by this, but not not really too bad, I guess. Um, but the counselors are kind of going through some stuff, I guess, because a couple months before the girls arrived at camp, there was actually um, a counselor that had her like belongings gone through. Yeah, from what I understand, they were there early, setting up everything, getting things ready. And it looked like things had been ransacked. Was anything stolen? I think that uh, some of her stuff was. I think I read like a pair of glasses or something like that were stolen. Sunglasses. Sunglasses, yeah. yeah. Um, but what's really kind of messed up about this is that they have like a box of donuts. And when they open it, there's a handwritten note. And it says that they, whoever this is, is promising that they're going to murder three campers. Now, 2019, that camp's shutting down. I mean, I mean, we're, there's going to be like a huge investigation, but back at this time, the counselors just thought it was a, a prank. So probably thought the Boy Scouts or something like that were messing with them, trying to scare them uh, and stuff like that. It wasn't taken very seriously at the time. Yeah, 2019, there's cameras there. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. And this thing is solved. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or not happening. Right. Because the cameras are enough to deter it. But I'll tell you what, that would freak me out. You know, you're away at a camp. Setting up, there's not much going on. Your stuff's going gone through. Probably would suspect it's another counselor. That's what I would think you know, too. Probably, yeah. Ni- nice fucking joke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know? hilarious. But you know, when they see this light in the woods, they don't take it too too seriously either. And um, they basically do their checks and head back in for the night. And uh, throughout the night, the counselors are actually hearing some kind of like weird noises. Yeah, what was it described as guttural noises? Um, I don't know, man. They're in the woods. I I personally may not think much of it. I go in the woods looking to hear noises. Right, right. You know, so in you know, Oklahoma, that could be a wild boar or something like that. I mean, a lot of deer there too. I yeah. mean, that's a good place for for deer as well. So I mean, I would just think it's some kind of wildlife moving around in the darkness, but with a flashlight. <laughs> not with that. You know, when you start adding things together, you got right. weird noises. You got a flashlight. We have that strange letter left in a donut box two months earlier. I mean. Uh, in 2019, I've already seen the Jason Voorhees movies. Yeah. I'm panicking. They I'm, I'm going been, home. Those haven't even come out yet, so they're not even thinking that way. You right. know what I mean? They're just... But, Different you know. times, for sure. Yeah. But uh, the next morning around 6 a.m., one of the camp counselors, uh, this is on June 13th, um, she wakes up early on the regular, and I guess she decides that she's going to go take a shower you know, before everybody gets up for the day and then yeah. stuff like that. So um, she's walking towards the uh, the bathroom with the showers, and she sees, like, a sleeping bag in the forest, which kind of weird, but... That's the first thing that's spoken me, man, Yeah. at this point, yeah. Like, what's happening? You got young kids here. I'm probably thinking, young kids, there's some kind of goofing off going on, and uh, one of them got out of the tent and fell asleep outside. Something like waking that. Waking up yeah. with dew on her face and all soaked. You know, yeah, that's what yeah. I'd be thinking. Yeah, nothing, nothing too sinister for sure. No. But when she gets near this uh, sleeping bag, she actually notices that there's a, a small little body in it. Mm-hmm. Now, from what I understand, they don't. She doesn't open the bag. She just can tell there's somebody in there. So of course, at this point, you know, some of the alarm bells in her head are ringing a little bit, and you know, she gets a hold of uh, some of the other counselors, and they start searching around. And it doesn't take him very long to find out that all three of the girls that were in tent number eight had been killed that night. From what I understand, their bodies had all been left along the trail that was leading to the showers. Wow. Yeah. About 150 yards, too. So they were kind of spread out, I believe. You would think that this would have made a lot of noise. But the fact that, like you said earlier, they were spread out, the tents, about 80 yards. People are sleeping and such. Might explain those guttural noises, I guess. That that'd be my guess as well. And you know, it's uh, it's found that all three of the girls that were murdered had uh, had gone through some pretty horrific stuff. Denise was actually strangled to death, and um, all three of them had been sexually assaulted and uh, 
and and beaten pretty badly, almost beyond recognition. So definitely not something that they foresaw happening that night. And it's an absolute terrible tragedy that some of these things that could have prevented it, you know, investigating the flashlight or something like that, you know, were overlooked at the time. I know, but you just don't think that murder's on the horizon. You right. know, it's just one of those things, you know. I mean, I'm, like I said earlier, myself being there, I would uh, some other campers from another camp, you yeah. know, doing some, some private guys out in a tent fishing somewhere. I don't know, you know. I'm, but it is a terrible thing, man. I mean, there's these three girls that are found bludgeoned, sexually assaulted, and scattered on the way to the showers. And yeah. It's, yeah, and with their uh, with their bodies, actually, uh, the police find a large red flashlight that was kind of left on top of them, and there was actually a fingerprint on this flashlight, but they've never been able to identify it. So obviously, this flashlight from the night before probably has uh, has something to do with this. Another thing that they were able to uh, identify was a footprint from a size nine and a half shoe that was found in blood in the tent. That's kind of a Kind of a small shoe for a man, I think. Well, I get a nine and a half shoe. Man. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're right, man. Not a very, uh, very big man, but possibly even a woman. That's also true. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's uh, a shoe print is a shoe print. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, the gender of the person. So, um, the police actually at this point are kind of knee deep in this and they decide to bring in some uh, some canine tracking dogs um that will hopefully be able to you know find out the the trail that this person came from yeah yeah and did we get any uh anything from that did they, were they able to identify anything uh unfortunately this is actually another sad part of the story one of the dogs that were was involved in this actually died due to heat stroke and another dog was actually killed when it ran into traffic on the road. Must have been real comfortable in those tents if the dog died from heat stroke. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Shoo. Now, investigators did find a single hair that did not belong to any of the victims. Uh, that's something they were able to identify. After the hair was analyzed and tested, it was determined that it came from uh, a Native American. Not uncommon in Oklahoma. There's, you know, especially during this time, that's one of the few places that still does have... Uh, Definitely a rich Native American background. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So um, investigators are starting to look at some suspects, and uh, one of the first people they focus on is a man named Jack Schroff. Uh He actually owns a ranch near Camp Scott, and at, at the time uh, that this all happened, he had black duct tape at his home and rope that actually uh, was identical to some black duct tape and rope that they had found uh, at the scene of the murders. Eh, I don't know, man. Duct tape, rope, how many duct tape and rope manufacturers are distributing in 1977 in Locust Grove? Right, right. I mean, it's not that Yeah, and I guess... It's certainly circumstantial. Right, it is, but, I mean, if it matches what's there, I mean, that is definitely interesting, but... He lives close by, it could explain why you'd see somebody with a flashlight, you wouldn't have to go far, also. Right, right. I mean, but Schroff actually claims that his home was actually broken into uh, shortly before the murders, and... Those items are actually uh, some of the things that had been stolen. Were they able to prove that? Uh, not necessarily, but he uh, did take a polygraph test, which, you know, how we feel about those. Yeah. Um, but he, he was able to pass it, and he also had a pretty solid alibi for that night. So uh, the police kind of you know, clear him as a suspect relatively quickly. It's definitely, uh, yeah, I think, I think there must have been something there that they were able to quickly rule him out. Even though there's some circumstantial evidence, there must have been something that... Right, right. Uh, you know, cleared quickly, I guess. Yeah, and this would lead us to our next suspect, probably the main suspect, I guess you could say. This would be Gene Hart. Yeah, Gene Hart was a, um, a Cherokee, native Cherokee from the area, and uh, he had actually been to uh, jail. He had a very extensive criminal record. Uh, he had actually been given uh, three 10-year sentences just 10 years earlier for raping two pregnant women. But he actually gets paroled just three years later. And then he gets arrested for burglary. And then he escapes prison. And Yeah, and this was in 1973 that he escaped prison. Right, okay. so what's this, three, four, four years before the murders? Yeah, and from 1973 on, he's on the run. Yeah, he, uh, he basically is just couch surfing, I guess we'd say these days. Yeah. And uh, hiding out wherever he has to, to to avoid the fuzz. Yeah, Jason, and as you mentioned, with him being Cherokee, 
is he's getting a lot of support from his community as far as places where he can stay and uh, being tight lipped when it comes to the you know the the authorities. I mean, because and a lot of these people believe that he didn't do these crimes. Also, so if you believe your friend and your uh, I guess your brother, you could say didn't do this, you're going to do everything you can to try to help them. Right, and this community had been through a lot, and uh, the Native Americans basically just think that the police is out to get one of them for these murders, to, you know, to breed distrust within the community, I guess you'd say. Yeah, you almost get the feel like maybe in the past the authorities had, you know, harassed this community a bit. Just kind of the feel that you get, you know what I mean? The resentment that towards law enforcement. And so when you're being abused continuously... I can see, you know, being kind of standoffish when it comes to helping them. Right, right. And, um, you know, r- right, the race issue becomes a huge part of this trial um, due to the, the Native Americans' concerns about the police. But at this point, they have Hart as a suspect, and they really don't have any evidence that he was out in the woods. They just kind of are suspecting him because of his past. Yeah. Well, what ends up happening is that several days after the murder... Some hunters discovered a cave in which it appeared to be inhabited, like somebody was, you know, living there, right? Yeah, was this this actually pretty close to the camp? I think it was within a half a mile. Yeah, I think that from what I had read, you could almost uh, overlook the camp from the cave. Yeah, it it seemed like it was somewhere up high, you could overlook that. And on a side note, Hart's mother lived fairly close to that camp as well. Yeah, close enough at least. Close enough, yeah. Yeah, so when the hunters find this cave, uh, what do they find in it? Well, they find uh, a number of items really, including photos which Hart possessed in jail. So you can almost think that Hart had been to this cave, obviously. Yeah, I think from what I had read, he actually, while he was in prison, he kind of helped with like a... developing film and whatnot. Yeah. And this was actually photos that had, uh, that he had developed for somebody of like a wedding or something like that. While in prison. Right. Okay. That would would make sense. But why would he still have them when he went on the run is is kind of odd. Yeah. When you don't have many possessions, you cherish everything maybe. Right. Uh, They also found uh, women's glasses, which is kind of interesting because we would stated earlier that there was a set of women's glasses that had been stolen from a counselor. Right, right. As well as a newspaper, as well as newspapers. Yeah, and what's interesting about those newspapers is that flashlight that they discovered at the crime scene uh, with the girls, there was actually some crumbled up paper in there um, to kind of help keep the batteries in place, I think. I think Maybe to was, stop it from jiggling around, to make, make it quiet. But Absolutely, definitely a possibility. But uh, the newspaper that was found in that flashlight actually matches this newspaper that they find in the cave. Uh, so this isn't looking good for this guy at all. Not at all. I mean, there's still only circumstantial evidence that Hart was in this cave, but very clearly uh, somebody was because of these items. But what's the worst part of this is they find a note on the wall. It says uh, 77617, which is, of course, uh, the date. The date of the crime. The date of the crime. Yeah. And underneath that, it says the real killer was here. Bye-bye, fools. Yeah, so that's that's almost a dead giveaway, in my opinion. It's either a dead giveaway or it's somebody uh, just trying to mislead the A dead police. setup. Right. Like somebody that might have committed the crime, knew Hart was staying there and was trying to frame him. Right. Interesting. I never looked at it that way, man, but that that is a possibility. That's a lot of work. Yeah. Go, think... go do terrible things to three children, run away and frame somebody all within a short period of time, but not impossible. Yeah, and um, so they find all this evidence, and they assume it's where Gene's been staying. But as they're looking, they actually find uh, one of the Native Americans in the community. His name was Pigeon. Uh, they go up to his house, and they actually find Hart in uh, Gene Hart actually inside Pigeon's house. As a hiding out there, hiding place out, to right. stay temporarily. Yeah, right. And the police actually, uh, when they are apprehending him, they ask him if he's the one who killed the girls, and he actually replies to them, "You'll never be able to pin this on me." And then he stopped talking to the police. Is that what you're going to say, Jason? If you if you you know didn't do anything, you didn't commit a crime, the police are pulling you away to their car, and they ask you, Jason, did you do it? What are you saying? You know, I, I wonder the context in which he said this. Um, you know, you'll never pin it on me. Like, ha ha ha, yeah, I did, but good luck proving it. Or if it was more, you'll never pin this on me, like, he thinks that the police would, uh, you know, falsely plan evidence and whatnot to try to pin this on him, essentially. You know what, man? You do bring up a good point, because a lot of times, 
always, it'll happen today in some way in the media, newspaper, whatever, things will be taken out of context and things will that are benign in, in nature are, are turned evil, you know, or vice versa. You right, know what I right, mean? So right. you're almost, you're, you're right. I almost want to know what was said two minutes before and two minutes after. Right, exactly. You know, kind of a thing. Because... Mm -hmm. Who knows? I mean, but the guy does kind of look guilty to me so far. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, regardless of the circumstances, I mean, uh, he's got to go back to jail for those other crimes. And, yeah, you know, it's not a good look, but he uh, he stops talking to the police, which I don't blame him. That's always a good, uh, that's a good way to go about things. If you don't talk, you don't implicate yourself in anything. No, so. almost immediately, uh, his supporters, the residents of his community, they, they become very upset and they come out to heart support right away yeah yeah and you know they're obviously thinking this is just a setup but uh when the police search the rest of pigeon's house uh they find out that harry had been living there but they don't find any other you know items of interest they don't find any of the uh the tape or the rope or anything like that uh that you would think that they were looking for well i mean if you did it are you going to hang on to these things well, it's hard to tell them, but the police would say yes, because they search again, and then the second time, they actually find items uh, in the residence that are claimed to be items that were stolen from that camp counselor uh, before camp had begun. But the community is stating uh, at this point that the items that were left and found at the camp and the items that were found in the cave were planted by the authorities. This yeah, is yeah. Their, what they believe. Right, right. There's... Uh, actually some speculation that the uh, sheriff had photos um, that belonged to Gene in his desk at the jail. So, you know, these photos that they're saying that Gene developed, supposedly people say that the sheriff had him in his desk. So, you know, if Gene had him, it'd be kind of weird to, to continuously pull him over. But I guess when you're in jail, pictures are uh, all you're going to get. I think, yeah, of course, you know. So seems like a lot. And, and if the police were going to frame Gene, then how... How would you, what would be the purpose? You get three dead girls, you have a sick, sick killer on the loose. Why would you frame this guy that if you find him, he's already going back? You know what I'm saying? You don't need to frame Gene for anything. All you got to do is arrest him for the original crimes in which he committed, and he's off the streets. If that's, if you really have this vendetta against him, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that uh, there, there's two parts to that. I mean, of course, part of the community. It's completely with Gene and, you know, this is not him, you're framing him, yada, yada. And the other part of the community is just glad that they have somebody for peace of mind. They don't have this killer that's going out and killing children in their community because the police have found him. So right. there's, there's two schools to that. But, you know, they have some good points because uh, as this trial goes on, it turns into quite a circus with the evidence and things like that in a, prose a prosecution case. S speaking of, of turning out into quite a circus... The, the spectators of the trial, his community came out in, in huge support. They were in the courthouse. They were outside of the building. They were rallying for Gene. Yeah, big time. Big time. Big time. Yeah. He was like a local football star, too, which if you know anything about Oklahoma, if you're good on the football field, you can get whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, They're sure. Very, very serious. About local the hero in some, some ways. Absolutely. Um, but some of the evidence that uh, they are contesting is that there was a bloody footprint that was found in the tent, uh, which was like a size nine and a half or something like that. And I think Gene wore like a size 11. Okay. Something like that. So you can go up a shoe size. If you're really a size nine, sure, wear a size 11. Who cares? But you can't be a size 11 and fit in a nine and a half. Almost reminds me of like O.J. Simpson with the bloody glove. Yeah, for real. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. But that was uh, that was too small to match Gene. And this fingerprint was. So... Or the, or the, the footprint. footprint, rather, right. yeah. But you speaking of fingerprints, they were able to say that the fingerprint on the flashlight did not match hearts. Could it be two people? That's a, that's a good theory. I mean, you would think that it would be hard for uh, one person to rein in th three, eight, nine, ten-year-old girls. I mean, you'd think they'd put up a fight that would be very difficult for for one person. Well, yeah, I mean... At least well, working together. While you're doing one thing to one person, you know, one child, what are you doing with the other two? Are they just, you know, right. in the corner in fear? Well, they did say there was rope involved, so maybe he had them tied up or something, but just horrible no matter what. But yeah. um, they actually take swabs uh, from the girls uh, because, like we would mentioned before, they all were sexually assaulted. 
Um, and th on these swabs, they're actually, um, the evidence, I guess it's DNA at the time. Yeah. They, uh, which is very limited. In very 1977. limited. 77. Right. And, uh, they were similar marks to Gene's DNA, but it could not be a guaranteed match, which is interesting. I don't understand that too much, but I think I had read that, uh, he cl claimed that he had had a vasectomy. Yeah. And... So the swabs couldn't have been from him because the swabs were from somebody who hadn't had a vasectomy. What's odd about that is later on after Gene uh, passes away, they actually find out that his vasectomy never took. So never it very took. well could have been him. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Um, another thing that was claimed during the court trials was that the hair was Hart's. But again, uh, it only looked like Hart's hair. And it doesn't mean that it was. I mean, there was no way to positively test this at the time right right it's kind of like they look under look at it under a microscope and go yep look alike that's about it i mean it's weird to me because like i'm i'm 31 you're around my age as yeah. well and we kind of just grew up in an area and uh, in, in a time where um you know dna and everything is so normal to us but that didn't always exist to the extent that it does now yeah you almost have to take yourself back when you look at these stories for sure yeah it's definitely yeah. hard I and mean, it's weird to think like oh yeah there's no cell phones at this time and, and stuff like that i mean probably barely even good walkie-talkies for these girls like it's just, it's weird as the trial continued on his defense continued to emphasize the possibility of evidence being planted to frame hart Seems like a lot, man. Seems like a lot. He doesn't seem to me to be a guy you gotta frame. Yeah, he's I already agree. done terrible things and needs to go back to prison for what he's done already. Right I, off the I bat. agree. And the, the pregnant women that he had uh, raped originally and been sent to jail for, they actually uh, tell the police their story of what happened, of course. And it's very, very similar to what police think happened to these girls. So sure was. It was. Uh, you know, they both said that rope and duct tape were used, which obviously were on these girls. I thought it was very similar, man. Very similar. Eerily similar. Very. Very, very, very weird. Uh, so after hearing the evidence and how unclear it was, the jury took only six hours to deliberate, and they found that Hart was not guilty of these murders. Six hours is not a long time in a case of this magnitude. No. And, and you almost wonder this, right? The jury was, I believe, mostly white people, and the Hart had so much support in the courthouse and outside of the courthouse, and a lot of these people were angry. They were very angry, and you almost feel like, did they go not guilty for fear that they were going to be attacked themselves, and then also knowing that he is going back to prison for the crimes that he's committed. Yeah, I think he goes back... Um to serve like a, another 305 years or something like that. Right. So either way, he's going to prison. If you say not guilty, you can get out of the courthouse and not have your head taken off. This is also Oklahoma, though, and I would assume that this would probably be a, a death penalty case. Yeah, I would imagine. Possibility. Yeah. So, you know, it's... I, I could only imagine if, what these jurors were thinking when they saw the mobs outside. It must have been like the, a fear of getting, you know, lynch mobbed, basically, if, uh, if you ruled against Hart. Right, yeah, you know. So, uh, nonetheless, he's found not guilty, and he is brought back to prison, like you stated, to uh, serve his remaining 305 years for his previous crimes. Yeah, he doesn't make it that long, though. No, he only makes it about two months, and then he uh, suffers a massive heart attack, and he dies at the age of 35. Well, let's just say if he did commit these crimes, he deserves it. And at this time, this is when they checked his, uh, his vasectomy at the time of his autopsy and such. And that was when they were able to realize that it had not worked. It had uh, not took. So, how I mean, pissed would you be if you had a vasectomy and it didn't work? Well, oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah. at this point, it didn't really affect him too much because he was dead. But things did not look very good for him. I don't know, man. What do you think? I think it was Gene Hart. Was it Gene Hart alone or was it Gene Hart with some help? I mean, how could you explain the fingerprint not being his or any of the victims or anybody else that's there or the size 9 footprint? Like I said, I have a size 9, you have a size 11. Gene Hart was a size 11 and the print was a size 9. I could walk around in your shoes. I'd look like Donald Duck a little bit, you know, kind of flopping around. But you could not put your feet in my shoes. No, I'm not without severely scrunching them and hurting them. I couldn't imagine walking... A distance from, say, this cave to the, the campsites with shoes that are two sizes too small. An 11 to a 10 would be very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, to commit all these acts to go down that size, I don't know. What do you think? Did he have help? Was there an accomplice? I just don't know who it would be. I mean, it could maybe Pigeon or something. But I was going to uh, say, who was the Pigeon, potentially, right? How much did they look into? Did they measure Pigeon's feet? <laughs> just sounds funny. I know. <laughs> but you know what I mean, though? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I think that that's kind of an odd piece of uh, evidence. But who's to say that that shoe print wasn't from uh, one of the counselors or whatnot that was originally searching? That's true, too. I mean, did, how much of that did they look into? Did they look at to rule out anybody's feet? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, how much of that did they, they dig into? Right, right. Um, the evidence of uh, the, uh, the fingerprint, I mean, I don't, I don't know how you would say, how you, you know, debunk that. If it's not his fingerprint, it, might, it had to have been... Maybe an accomplice. Yeah, but how about this one also? Uh, there was a number of items stolen out of that guy's house that we had said earlier, right? Yeah. The first guy that they had looked at as a suspect. Did they steal a flashlight that maybe somebody, from him that maybe somebody, him, or well, maybe not him, so I'm sure they would have checked that, somebody else that maybe was visiting, or right, right. a neighbor. That's a very good point. I hadn't, hadn't thought of that, but... Um... I mean, if you're looking to steal supplies to commit a crime, you got rope, duct tape, and a flashlight right here. Yeah, that's the starter you know, kit. Murder starter kit, yeah. Just need the zip ties and the black trash bags. It would also make sense that he would be uh, maybe the person who was staying in this cave as he was on the run. Yeah. I mean, if I'm on the run from the police and I find a cave out in a desolate area, that's a pretty good place to hide. And you know what? Another thing is, Gene Hart's from the area. Like we said, his mother... His mother's residence was, I think, half an hour, a half a mile from the cave. Right. He knows this area quite well. And we said at the very beginning of this podcast that the Girl Scouts of America had been operating this vicinity, this vicinity here for 50 years. I bet you, like a lot of things that happen in small communities, this camp opened up every single weekend, you know, June 12th or whatever, whatever that weekend Second involved. week of June. Second week of like June. That, yeah. For the past 50 years, most likely, and Gene probably knew that this was going to be opened up at this time, if it was him. And that would explain how he knew to go down, check out the counselor's stuff, steal a few things, maybe take some sunglasses back to the cave, and leave a little note in the donut box. Yeah, yeah, that's, what a weird note, though, and, and I don't, I just don't understand how that was overlooked like it was. Because these things were just not something that anybody thought would be imaginable to happen at this camp. I guess so. One thing that I forgot to mention that uh, is very odd as well is that when they arrested Gene at Pigeon's house, he had actually been wearing a pair of women's glasses. This was something that he had been known to do. Yeah, he kind of had like a, some weird fetishes or something. As a lot of times these people have. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. you've noticed that uh, from all the research we do from all these wonderful people. It's strange. There's always some kind of weird thing going on with him but yeah man I, I can almost in my mind I see Gene Hart knowing that this is going to happen hiding in a cave and this guy has got a history of, of assaulting and beating women and doing terrible things and that itch came back that that urge to have to to hurt to do something to, to get the satisfaction that he he needs right. as being a, a person like he is and he sat in that cave and he knew that Something was good, that this camp was going to be opening up real soon. He knew it, and that urge was there, and he waited, and he went down, and he left his, he left his mark. He took the glasses, he left the note, and he went back to his cave, and he just sat there in excitement. You know, after he did that, you know, the thrill of just going down there, and then he waited another two months, and then that very first night came, and he couldn't wait any longer, and Gene Hart struck. Was he? Did he do it alone? Did he do it with some help? That I don't know about, my friend. Well, here's another interesting thing, is that one of the women who he had raped previously had actually mentioned to investigators that while he was raping her, he made some strange guttural sounds. Really? She says that it was like sounds like she had never never heard before and thought it was very odd, but that would explain those guttural sounds that the camp counselor heard on that night. Wow, I'll tell you what, you can almost, there is almost some comfort that in knowing that Gene Hart didn't last too long, he didn't have another chance to escape from prison. It would have just been nice if at some point maybe the truth would have come out um, yeah. from, from Gene, because I, I think that Gene was guilty, that's my opinion, but, uh, you know, the 
the, the verdict uh, is what it is, I guess. Yeah, and this, in a sense, I guess you could say, remains unsolved. There remains a mystery. Do they still look into this case from time to time? I mean, it still has some popularity behind it. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure if they got a tip they found was credible, uh, you know, they would certainly investigate it. But I, I don't think this is, you know, top shelf investigating right now. But, you know, always, always investigate because it is still unsolved. And I'm, I'm sure that... Uh, a lot of the people who are involved with this are probably passed by now, but... Um, there may be some people that, that know the truth still, though. They may. Maybe they may. the person with the size 9 shoe print is still around, if, in fact, there was a, a second person. I just, that shoe print, I just, I, I gotta think it was a counselor. It's just, it's just it, weird to me, but the, the thing that really I go back and forth on is they never really proved that Gene was in this cave. All of the stuff that was found in the cave, they say, had some link to Gene. But there's no proof other than that. I mean, nobody, he doesn't admit it. Nobody says Gene was in there. Yeah, but if they're able to link all the stuff to the cave to Gene, even that newspaper, in which they're able to find a page from that newspaper, pieces from a page, in the flashlight that's left at the crime scene. I'm saying, though, is that somebody was in the cave. It could have been the killer. But you can't definitively say that it was Gene that was in that cave. It could have been a completely different person. Perhaps a person with a five, uh, 9.5 you know, footprint. Yeah, maybe a couple people. Yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of leaning towards there was a couple people involved, you know? It's just weird that over time, I mean, there, there's never really been evidence of two people. Like, uh, as far as, you know, they didn't find uh, two sets of fingerprints or two sets of footprints. They found one. But they did find ways to link Gene to the crime and evidence of somebody else possibly being involved and to kind of go on other stories you're very familiar and i'm sure a lot of our listeners are with the west memphis three case yeah uh, that's one that has been interesting me for years and it involves three you know little boys who end up getting tied up and you always wonder how can one person be tying up one child well there's two more aren't one of them going to try to run or something going to happen you know what I mean? Scream. Scream. There's other people around. There's, there's, there's other camps. There's other tents. Right. You always want to, you know, create chaos in a situation like that. But you could have one person watching two kids while, one, while another one's tying one up. Or two people tying up one and each and somebody watching the kid. It just seems like a lot and very difficult to do as a single person. I, I agree. I mean, they were bludgeoned, though, so who knows if he had bludgeoned them. First. Initially, and they were incapacitated uh, in some way, but, um, it's just, man, what a terrible crime. Yeah, and uh, after all this was said and done, the parents of Lori Farmer and Dor Doris Milner filed a $5 million lawsuit against Magic Empire Council, accusing them of negligence, which resulted in the deaths of their daughters. Yeah, they had said that the, uh, in, in their lawsuit, they had said that the note that was found by the counselor should have been investigated, which of course it should have, but also saying that the girls were unsafe due to the location of their tent and the location of the counselor's tent. So, um, unfortunately, again, the jury ruled in favor of the camp. Yeah, well, the camp did have 50 years of a of good record. Right, right, you know? it's true. But the camp didn't kill these kids. Somebody killed these kids. I, I agree. And, and I, I understand. It. And I can also understand where the families came from, too. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We have signed the waivers. We have paid you. Our children should be safe. Right. And I, I definitely agree that uh, my 8-year-old shouldn't be 100 yards away from the counselors. Or probably further, man. Because, like you said, it was a crescent. I think straight across it was about 100 yards. Was it? Okay. Nonetheless... Nonetheless, three three young kids, not even ten years old, in a tent that far away. Yeah, I mean, even when I go camping and like my son will lay down before us, I always stay within you know earshot of if he were to say, "Hey, Dad," okay, I gotta uh, I gotta go get that. But yeah, right. Yeah. If, if these girls were in tent eight and they were yelling to the counselors, I don't think the counselors are hearing it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I definitely understand, you know, where the family's coming from and. Um, unfortunately, uh, don't go to a court in Oklahoma because uh, you're, you're going to be found uh, not in your favor, I think. Yeah, twice these, this family takes a hit. The guy that so obviously, in my opinion, had done this, I mean, I know he's obviously go gets sentenced and goes to jail and dies two months later, but for, or not sentenced rather, but goes to prison for what he escaped for and dies two months later. Yeah. But the fact that nobody's ever found guilty has no closure. 
And, and I think that most people think Gene did do this, though. And there's just so much evidence that points to him. Yeah. The sounds and his M.O., every, everything leads right to, right to Gene. So I think that the family kind of has uh, satisfaction, I guess you would say, that they know who it was. But, of course, legally, it's unsolved. Yeah, and will probably remain unsolved yeah. forever. Yeah. That would be my guess. What do you guys think at home or on the subway? or on your commute to work, tell us. Shoot us an email at therigormortispodcast at gmail.com. Yes, you can also find us on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Facebook at the Rick and Mortis Podcast as well. That's if right. Adam doesn't keep getting us locked out of Instagram. Sorry about that. And if I do, you can always follow me at Dr. Skelly Fingers on Twitter and Instagram. Perfect. Once again, everybody, thank you for listening, and we'll catch you next week.